to do your final lecture for us. Southwest get their act together, and uh, we had a lot of getting together to get together. Um, and uh, we spent, uh, I was on the uh, uh, board of directors for the region and also on the executive uh, uh, committee of the region, and uh, so we spent a lot of close time together for a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, when we came back, and what we came up with was a mission statement that thrilled everybody and uh, some excitement about what we could do in our churches. And I think uh, he just gave us some things to consider that we'd never considered before. So it was wonderful. So I, I underscore that uh, again. And uh, let me just say, uh, uh, there was uh, one pastor that asked me um, earlier today about, is that $20 registration fee next year really necessary? Well, it is if we get people at the caliber of George Bullard. Uh, while we do appreciate all of the funds that have come through, and they do help us uh, in the uh, uh, Simpson uh, endowment, it does not cover all of the expenses. So we've had to subsidize that considerably for the uh, Simpson lectureship series. And uh, we're at this point now, next year, we think that we're going to have to add a little bit. The average is $75 a day registration fee when you go to a conference. And if it's two or three days, it goes upwards uh, in accordance. And we're looking at about six bucks a day, and I hope that you can afford it for three days next year. So if you keep that in mind, six fifty, or you can divide that last two dollars up any way that you choose. But I hope that you'll you'll plan to come to that. I, I think it'll be an exciting time. Uh, let me share with you a couple of comments. Uh, well, I'm at that stage now. I'm delighted that all of you have come who could make it out on the snowy storm night. And uh, what I have hoped to do is not to give you all of the answers. I frankly don't know all of the answers. I think church ministry is so buried. And every year that I was in ministry, I found things I never heard of in seminary. And that wasn't because the seminary didn't know something. It was because there are things that you just simply don't know. They might be very unique to your congregation. I suspect if you pastored two or three churches, you found certain things that have happened in one of them that I'd never heard of that before. And how do we relate those kinds of things? Well, that's the kind of a uh, hope that I've had along the way, is at least to stimulate some thinking in terms of what our mission is and how we can better accomplish it uh, for the kingdom. Uh, tonight is uh, that area that uh, I don't expect any consensus before we leave this place. I will simply try to share with you a little bit about uh, what uh, what I have seen and observed, and I suspect many of you have done the same. I've talked with, with several of you who have read a number of books that I have and some that I haven't. And uh, in fact, I've asked a couple of folks, please write that down for me because I didn't know of that one. Uh, the libraries are bulging now, the bookshelves are bulging in this particular area. How to help a church become a healthy church. And I think... Uh, uh, we're all in learning stages. This whole discipline is not much more than 30 years old. And uh, most of the literature that's 10 years old is out of date. So you really have to do a lot of reading to stay up on things. And we're just simply trying to say, uh, whatever it takes to accomplish the work that God has called us to do, that's what we want to do. Uh, there's times when I feel very much like the uh, pastor at a new church who was met every Sunday after church by a young man who stood in front of him and he said, one Sunday, Pastor, that is absolutely the worst sermon I've ever heard in my life. And uh, the next Sunday, this 12-year-old, uh, 11-year-old boy uh, came up to him and he said, Pastor, you are the poorest preacher I have ever heard in my life. And then the third Sunday, he came up again and he said, that was the most abomination, abominable preaching I have ever heard. And the pastor was really getting frustrated with it, so he went to the chairman of his deacons, and he said, who is that young man? He had even told him what he had said. And the chairman of the deacons said, Pastor, don't worry about him. He only repeats what he hears. <laughs> when we're dealing with the area of worship, that's when temperature levels 
often go higher. And people are wondering if, in fact, uh, uh, could that person really say that? Why, I disagree with that so profoundly. A few years ago, churches were dividing over theological issues. Now it seems like the most divisive issue within the church is the area of worship. And uh, how are we supposed to do it? I'll be upfront with you right off the bat and say, I don't think there's any one way to do it. There are some who come out in very arrogant ways and condescending ways, but they have found the only way that it can possibly be done. But as I have traveled around in different parts of the world, and I have found Christian communities who truly love the Lord and worship God in a variety of different ways. And you'll find a, a significant variety of expressions in the Bible. You're all familiar with one that those who want to have dignity and decorum and something that looks very impressive will say, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That is certainly a means of worship. And I have been in those kinds of experiences where my life was blessed and I sensed the presence of God. <clears throat> I also like to remind people that in the same Bible, there's a statement that says, Praise the Lord, it's Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the faithful. In the assembly. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. That's not a Baptist word. <laughs> making, melody, <laughs> making melody to him with tambourine. Liar. And the Lord takes pleasure. L, not L-I-K. <laughs> the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Psalm 150. The Psalter closes. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him. Notice this is praise God in his sanctuary. Probably a reference to the temple. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. <laughs> Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I didn't find in here either a piano or an organ, but the organ takes some wind to get in there. Maybe we can incorporate that somewhere along the way. There are those that feel that there's only certain kinds of instruments that should ever, uh, ever be used in a place of worship. There are some Christians today, they love the Lord very sincerely. They wouldn't allow any instruments within their worship experience. But the scripture says, let it all praise the Lord. Now, when it speaks about the loud clashing cymbals and the dance and all of that, Whatever else you want to say that is incompatible with the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. That is not a compatibility. A few years ago, our daughter came home at uh, Christmas time. She was a cadet at West Point. And she had a, uh, a two worship experiences a week that she went to. One was the cadet, uh, cadet chapel, which was a... Uh, high formal worship experience, uh, a chaplain from Gordon Conwell, the chaplain who oversaw things, who wore the robe and, and uh, various other kinds of activities. There was a lot of uh, formal liturgy within the service. She wore her uniform and the sash and the sword and all of that stuff, and she was an usher in the, in the chapel service. But on Saturday night, she met with a group of folks uh, from the Navigators. And it was a Christian, uh, Officer's Christian Fellowship uh, that uh, she loved an awful lot there. And they had a very free, open, contemporary style of worship on a Saturday night. None of the kids wore their uniforms, and they got their drums and their guitars and all of those other things out. And she loved it. And I remember her saying to me, when she came home at a Christmas time, she said, Dad, I can just never worship in a church that is like that formal service again. 
we really do it the right way on a Saturday night. And I said, honey, I love you with all of my heart, but that's the wrong attitude. Uh, I've been play in places where the only church service that was available was different than the one that I'm most used to and comfortable with. But I found wherever the name of Christ is proclaimed, I believe that I have an obligation to be a part of a family and the fellowship of Christ. And in certain places, it functions differently than in other places. And I think if we say that God always does it this way, or God never does it that way, and then go to the other extreme, extremes are almost invariably wrong in the family of Christ. Almost invariably. Those who say that I have experienced God with choruses, praise the Lord for them. Many of the songs are really choruses. They were put to music. Some of the choruses that are sung today are taken directly out of the psalms. I saw a criticism one time recently of a person who couldn't stand a chorus. And there was never such a thing as a good chorus. And he picked one out that was exactly a quote word for word from the psalms. <laughs> if you can't sing the scriptures and they were intended to be sung there are some Old Testament scholars today that have found they believe some of the actual musical notations for some of the Old Testament Psalms and uh, there's a book uh, that's been published in that regard it's a very interesting kind of a thing some of the music is incredibly celebrated just because it has five stanzas and a similar chorus at the bottom doesn't mean it's more godly than the others. Just because it's repeated once in a while doesn't mean it's more godly or less godly. Uh, we had a person come to a church service, or rather a business meeting at our church, who said he didn't want any chorus sung more than one time in the church. And every time somebody sang a chorus twice, we knew he was going to be calling the office on a Monday morning. <laughs> and then I took out a hymn book with him and showed him how often the same chorus is, is given at the end of a hymn, six stanzas and then the same chorus on each occasion. And then also in the Psalms where you have a similar kind of refrain. This is scriptural. There are some wonderful hymns. My spiritual journey, my pilgrimage, began with a hymn book. And I still love some of those hymns. I got very angry when the ones that I love the most, the more recent people who put hymn books together, took them out. I love Ring the Bells of Heaven, There is Joy Today. And others said that's not good enough. And they took it out. Uh, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you on the Old Testament uh, story of the Exodus uh, as the children of Israel come out of uh, Egypt. Oh, do I love that one. And it dropped out years ago. I love some of the wonderful hymns of the faith. This is going to surprise everybody. There's not one verse in the New Testament that says our mandate for mission is to preserve a hymn book. <laughs> That's not our goal. I spoke to the senior citizens across the street. They had a Sunday evening service. Uh, um, and this was about two years ago uh, in Alhambra. And before I went to their uh, service, I went to the library at Fuller. They have a wonderful musical library at the seminary. So I went in to do some research before I went there. And I asked the people, how many of you can give me the name of a hymn from the 10th century. Not a hand went up. I, and, and I had some. <laughs> How about the 11th or the 12th? We got up to the 16th century with Martin Luther before anybody could come up with a mighty fortress as our God or the Ifestaberg uh, uh, song that Luther was so famous uh, for. A beer hall song, but marvelous theology. There was a day when theologians and musicians actually communicated with each other. The day is no longer there. Sometimes it's not always the musician's fault. Theologians have tuned them out. The 
point is, most of those songs that were very special to a group of Christians in another generation, in another century, are no longer around today. And if you give it enough time, they'll all pass away. There's a few that have lingered for a few hundred years and some a little bit longer, but not that many. On occasion, I hear people saying, but the young people won't have the hymn book. They will not have all of the great hymns of the faith. Well, doggone it, you can't remember the ones from the 10th century. Why should they have to remember yours? <laughs> what does not pass away is the theology of the church and the Bible of the church. I'm just shooting from the hip here for a little bit to give you my perspective on the matter. My wife and I used to go to the Wieskirche in Germany. It's Bavaria, in Bavaria. It's a Catholic church. We visited there on several occasions. And we were blessed, and one of the things I really liked about the church was some of these chants that would go, and they would echo all over the place. And, and it would uh, have about five or 600 uh, seating capacity. And we went into this place uh, two years ago. We were back for the first time in 18 years. And I said, let's go to the Wieskirche. Um, so we went. And all of a sudden, outside of the place, before, we never saw many more than 40 or 50 in that church. And there were cars everywhere. And as we made our way up and into the door, the church was absolutely jammed. Every seat was taken. Every, the aisles were jammed full. In the back, it was five or six deep. We were at the back wall of the church, the Catholic church. And they were singing Carl Tuttle's song, Hosanna, to the King of Kings, with guitars, and drums, and the priest came out and walked among them and talked. And wow, did the kids listen. When I was there 20 years ago, there were no kids in that church. And now the place is full. They had a young priest who was out there. What did they give up? They gave up some chants that were very special, and I suspect it didn't go without a fight. But there were some good things that were occurring. They never had young people like that before. We estimated, and of course preachers you had to be careful about, there were 10,000 there. No, there were probably closer to 1,000. <laughs> I will take that any day. We made a change in a worship direction a number of years ago in our church. And it was because we kept seeing this going down in attendance. And we, we noticed, and when I got to the church, we had a lot of gray hair and no hair and not much else. The average age of the church I shared in one of the groups was 63. My wife and I were the young people in the church. And we were already in our late 40s. And we had a couple of teenage kids who were bored to death. And it was a very high church experience in the sense that we had a lot of formal liturgies and uh, responsive readings and different kinds of things that were typical to that church, and, uh, and yet it wasn't drawing the young people. My kids were bored to death, and they didn't really want to go to the church, but of course, they were the preacher's kids, and they had to be obedient, all of that thing. We began to make some changes after several years, because I finally concluded God had not called me to be the last pastor of any church. It does not look good on my resume, and I don't want to do it. And so we decided whatever it takes, we were going to try to attract the next generation. Because if we didn't, in just a few years, we'd have an awful lot of funerals, and then we'd have to donate the property back to the denomination. They could sell it and do whatever they could do with it. And when that kind of a thing occurs, something wonderful is lost. The life of the church, its witness in the community was gone. We were simply not being effective. So as we began to make some changes, and every change that came, there were people that grumbled. And every time we made some changes, I felt like I had to leave the motor on in the parking lot so I could get out of town in a hurry. <laughs> within a short time, within a couple of months, people made the transition. And uh, 
We only lost two people in the church, and we moved to more of a contemporary style of worship. Uh, periodically, we would pool the kids and have a neat hymn in there. They just didn't know it because it was on an insert in the bulletin. We, we didn't use the hymn book, but uh, we would sneak a good hymn in there every now and then. It was just a marvelous, marvelous hymn. And, so, and some of the kids were saying, wow, this is good stuff, <laughs> especially if there was a drummer in the background. <laughs> some of the hymns could really be recovered in beautiful ways. But we wanted a style of mu music that would appeal to them. There was a woman uh, by the name of Olga who came up to me. She was a senior, uh, long since retired from teaching. And she said, uh, Pastor, I want you to know that that kind of music is not my kind of music. But if it will bring the young people in, it's OK. And I gave her a hug. She had the right attitude. Many of the songs that drew the young people back into our church, and it did begin to grow and do some remarkable things, was music I didn't particularly care for. And those people who go to church saying, I want my needs met, are always the ones that grumble about everything, and they miss the point of what worship is, of giving ourselves away. When we come to church, we come to minister to one another and to give ourselves to one another and to be patient with one another and forbearant of one another. And when we do that, we can experience the presence of God in powerful ways and different kinds of contexts than we thought was possible. Well, that's my bias. I think there's room for change. Not every worship service ought to be the same. Not every kind of worship uh, service is bad. Uh, there are some people that think anything that isn't like their tradition is bad. I think we need to get away from that kind of a thing. One of the things that I hope to do on a regular basis is to get people out of a rut and try something different. Uh, there is a variety of worship experiences in the Bible there is certainly that in the early church, and I think we as a Christian community ought to recognize that we are people with different passions, prejudices, uh, uh, cultures, and certain kinds of music will appeal to one that won't appeal to another. I've been thrilled by going into some of the African American congregations. Whatever else you want to say about them, they're never boring. Nobody falls asleep. And I love the way that they get enthusiastically, completely involved in the music that they're singing. And uh, we had a, uh, a local black preacher not far from our church who came in and preached. And he brought his little choir with him. It was only about 75 people. <laughs> <laughs> they were a larger church than we were by far. Uh, they only had about 2,000 in worship. And the preacher came in, and as he began to preach, all of a sudden the people in the audience were interacting with him. Yes! And I mean, they were preaching back to him, and one of the persons from his church was standing up, yes, preacher, yes, preacher. And, and there's a rhythmic thing to it that I couldn't duplicate. My life, if it depended on it, I'd never do it right. But it was a wonderful experience to see what God was doing in a different way. I teased our choir director, their choir was going, you know, you know, with every song. <laughs> I said, how about, what do you think? And, uh, and he said, we, we'd obviously lose a few members if we did that. <laughs> we had um, a choir that um, we sang very traditional songs. And a lot of it was classical. And our church had the only music academy in the community. And it was the Fine Arts Academy of Alhambra. It was housed, it was run, it was owned and operated by our church. We had Mozart concerts. And we would fill up the church with a Mozart concert from people in the community who wanted to hear it. Uh, various other kinds of things were there. But we also recognized we weren't filling the church on a Sunday morning with Mozart. I remember that we had a, in a previous church, a woman who was a terrific singer. She sang in the opera in uh, San Francisco, an incredible voice. She and her husband made a lot of, uh, did a lot of musical things together. 
They traveled all around the country. He played a piano and an organ, and he wrote a lot of music, and some of it you might well be familiar with. We were thrilled when they came to be our music directors, but she started to kill our choir. She wanted them to sing classical music on a Sunday morning, but the people were not into that. She had them singing some Brahms stuff. Brahms is dead. And uh, I think most of the Brahms music, I, I love the lullaby, I can do that. But the song, the, the music that Brahms had was not the kind of music that resonated with the choir. And the choir got down to just about nine or ten people. And I finally had to say, you must change this, or we must change you. And she kept saying, this is what they need. I don't care what they want. And that attitude is what has killed many a church. This is what they need. I don't care what they want. Well, how in the world are you going to convince them and get them in the front door? I want to use all means, all ways possible, so that by any way that's possible, we may win some into the kingdom. Now, with all of that prejudice that I have given, I'm going to show a couple of things up here. Uh, certainly, I agree with a number of statements that have been made that in terms of the importance of worship, I don't know of any church that grows or does well without that kind of an experience. There is no hope for a transforming experience with God without worship. But is there one kind of worship that is right for all? No. And that is my starting point. Worship is an experience with God. It transforms us into the persons God wants us to be. We all need that experience. And all genuine worship is directed uh, to God. It enables us to discern God's will in a better way, a more clear way. And it gives us the strength that we need to carry out the will of God. There's something wonderful in the experience of worship. There's not one way to do it. And let me say, in terms of the origin and the meaning of Christian worship, you must go back into the Old Testament times and understand something of what worship was. And there are several stories in the Old Testament when God worked a phenomenal way in the life of a patriarch or somebody else, that patriarch responded either by setting up a stone of remembrance of the occasion or an altar, and they did a sacrifice for God. The uh, story, of course, of Abraham. God met and spoke to Abraham at Shechem, and he established a big stone. Some think they might, in fact, have found that stone. I'm not convinced, but I've got a picture of it. Uh, but it uh, uh, is a recent discovery in some archaeological excavations. But there was something that he responded to, the presence of God and the power of God in his life. Jacob did that, you remember, when uh, in Genesis chapter 28. He had an experience with God at Bethel. And he established a pile of stones. He built something as a way of saying thank you to God. As the children of Israel went across the Jordan River, they had stone, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then they put them in a pile to remind other people of the mighty power of God. Always the activities that people did, these were acts of worship, of praise to God for what God had done. Whenever God has done something in our lives, we respond in thankfulness either by a sacrifice, which was the common experience, or a song or a prayer. You'll find Miriam gives a prayer, I'm sorry, a song to God when the children of Israel are allowed to come out of the land of Egypt, Exodus chapter 15. And when Hannah beseeches the Lord, she wants to have a child, and God gives her this child, Samuel. Read it in 1 Samuel in chapter 2, her response to God and it comes in the form of a prayer, and it's a beautiful prayer. Worship in its basic form is our response to the presence and activity of God among us. And as you read the Bible, the responses vary with the individuals. Some gave a stone, some had erected an altar that spoke about sacrifice. God has done so much for me, I'm going to sacrifice my life, myself, 
for God because of his blessing in my life. Some people gave a song, some gave a prayer, some did all kinds of things. There were celebration moments. But these were all responses to the presence and the majesty of God in their lives. Uh, you can see the experience that Isaiah has in Isaiah chapter 6, that when Uzziah dies, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he is in the temple, and the train of the Lord is going through there. He senses the presence of God in powerful ways, and he responded by seeing his own inadequacies and his sinfulness. There are some who try to legislate all of the activity of God in their worship experience, and I think they cut short what God can do. Now, page two, wherever we're going in this, in the New Testament, the New Testament form of worship is essentially patterned after that of the synagogue. There were two forms of worship among the Jews. There was the temple worship that focused upon the sacrifice, and in the temple it was a house of prayer. But also in the synagogue, there was a more simple form of it. No one knows for sure where the synagogue came from. Uh, some suggest that it was started in Babylon when the Jews were taken into captivity, and they had to have some form of worship, and so they started the synagogue. The term that they gave to it is a Greek term, a gathering together, means the same thing as ecclesia or ecclesia, a gathering together or a called out community. It's exactly the same term, and sometimes they're used interchangeably. One time in the New Testament, it's in the book of James, where he speaks of the synagogue uh, in reference to the church. But this gathering of people did something very simple. It was dignified, but it was simple. They offered prayers. They read scripture. They had, if somebody was competent and capable, someone who would explain, expose what the scriptures themselves meant. And uh, there would be singing. So, uh, most of the singing would be of the psalms, but not necessarily the psalter that we have. We found a number of psalms that were, were sung that never wound up in our Bibles. There are a number of things that they did, but that was basically the core of it. The prayers, the uh, reading of scripture, the exposition, the singing of songs, and so on. And on occasion, offerings were taken to care for the ministries that were going on in that community. The Christian community, by and large, adopted that model. There are some churches today that emphasize the temple model, which has the focus upon sacrifice. And when you go to the churches, the, the ultimate, the apex of that service is the Eucharist or the, uh, the communion service. It reaches its apex there, and there is a sacrifice, a sense of sacrifice that takes place. That's not the Protestant tradition, but there are a number of Christians uh, who focus on that. Is one right and the other wrong? No, because none is commanded in the New Testament. But you find a number of patterns of worship in the New Testament. Most of them are fairly simple. I listed for you the terms for worship. Prosperneo is a fairly common one. It simply means to bow before the Lord. That's to bow the knee, bending the knee. Um, its primary focus is on adoration and veneration and submission. And I've listed a couple of references in terms of where they are. Uh, in the New Testament, Ganapateo is one that means bend the knee, and it's found in adoration texts, uh, such as in Luke uh, 22 and Matthew 17. The uh, Latreia, uh, from which we get uh, our word liturgy, the emphasis is on service, the offering uh, that uh, comes as a sacrifice of service. There are a number of references there. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service. Uh, we mentioned in another, uh, I don't know if it was afternoon or evening, that the German term picks up on this particular uh, aspect of it, focusing on worship as a service. It is what we render back to God, which is our service, based upon what God has done for us. There are some important uh, meanings that are found. All of the terms don't have the same meaning, but there's a lot of overlap. Essentially, the notion of service and adoration and praise, they come through in a number and a variety of texts. And there are sometimes people feel like that song. Uh, there's a popular song a few years ago, Sometimes Hallelujah. Have you heard that one? Sometimes praise the Lord. Sometimes gently singing and so on. A wonderful collection of ways. There's days when I feel 
really excited. And there's days when I'm so filled with awe and my eyes are filled with tears. I couldn't see the hymn book if I had to because God has touched my life in something in a way that, wow, um, it's, it's awesome. And whenever a person has experienced God in worship, there are all kinds of responses. I asked my wife the other day, we are driving back from Fredericton, and I said, um, Tell me about the worship service that you were in where you really experienced the presence of God. What was it like? And her first word was overwhelming. And I've heard other people, I've asked that same question, and I said, awe, joy, peace. Different people will give a different response to it. What is it that I experience in worship? And sometimes it's all of these. I've been in the same place and in a worship service, and one week I'll have one experience, and the next week I'll have another. And it doesn't always have to be the same. And the context of where the Christians are gives us a guideline in terms of the kinds of things that we have, uh, the kinds of experiences that we have. Now, uh, in the rituals in the New Testament, uh, there are basically five, and they're baptism, communion, uh, laying on of hands, <coughs> lifting up of hands, and the foot washing that took place in the context of when the Christians met. Uh, just a little higher, honey, and uh, even the next page, you can see them. I won't say much about them. You can find all kinds of discussions about those areas, but they were the common rituals of the early church. And uh, the communion, or the Eucharist, the word Eucharist means I give thanks. It, because Jesus gave thanks as he broke the bread, it is often called the Eucharist, the giving of thanks. It, and we break the bread together. It was a very common experience. Baptism and communion and the laying on of hands, which normally came as the implementation of the spirit, of the prayer of the spirit upon individuals came, or the commissioning of serv uh, persons for Christian service. Those are very, very common. Lifting up of hands, that's a typical one. You'll find it in the Old Testament and in the New. And I've listed a couple of the references in there, and that should be the book of Psalms. Uh, and that's a designation for something else besides, but um, in Psalm 133 uh, um, and also, or 134 and Psalm 143, you'll find references to people lifting up their hands and blessing the Lord in their time of worship. And of course, in the First Timothy passage, it's a little bit further down at the bottom, 2.8, uh, there is the uh, the call, I would that all men would lift up their hands in prayer, and I would add women as well. Uh, when Jesus speaks and blesses, he lifts up his hands. Uh, the notion of what stands behind the lifting up of hands, it's not unlike, the history of it is not unlike, when a police officer comes up and arrests you and says, lift up your hands. <coughs> that means I'm vulnerable and I submit. And that's the notion behind the lifting up of hands. I served in a church, uh, that's a, a quick summary, there's much more behind that. I served in a church where there was a man who couldn't stand it when there were a few believers who came in when they were singing and they would lift up their hands. And some do it this way, some do it this way, some back and forth. And this person came into our deacon's board and he said, I want you to pass a resolution that nobody can lift their hands in church. <laughs> and I said, oh, may God help us if we go on record as a board of deacons voting against something the scriptures actually recommend. Screwball. Anyway, as you can tell, I'm unbiased on that subject. <laughs> Early Christian worship services, again, the content following the order of the synagogue, or the uh, prayers, the reading of scripture, the explanation, the uh, singing of the spiritual songs, uh, contributions uh, uh, to those who were in need, that was a typical response of worship in the early church, caring for those who were within the family. It was corporate, and you'll see a number of references, Acts 2, 40, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Acts chapter 3, it's verses 42 through 47, speaks about how they shared their, Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 47, uh, or 37, speaks about how they shared, no one had need. 
those who came with shared with those who uh, did not have anything. There was something that was corporate about the acts of worship in which people were able to share with one another. Uh, the times of worship uh, essentially were um, uh, Saturday night. Uh, normally, uh, the people, the Christians, the first Christians would go uh, to the synagogue or to the temple on uh, uh, a Sabbath morning. And then they would have their meetings on that evening or the night before. And very soon, certainly by around 50, some Christians began to meet, and Paul mentions it, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, on the first day of the week. In the book of Revelation in chapter 1, you see that that was in reference to the Lord's day when Jesus was raised from the dead. And some of the early, early church fathers explain why they chose the first day of the week. But there's something about the first day we need to understand. It was not a holiday. And so people normally met in the evening on the first day of the week. And there's some references uh, in the New Testament on that very thing. There are a number of uh, times that the church met to do its worship. The only thing that I would say is that they were incredibly flexible. They wanted to honor the Lord. And eventually, in church history, that day was set aside as the day off, and everybody took it to go uh, to worship the Lord in the temple. But uh, that was not necessarily so at the very beginning. They met in the evenings. And one of the examples you have where some of those who were well off and could get there earlier, they didn't work the whole day. They got to the, the gathering in the home earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 and following, and they ate the food. They brought the porterhouse steaks and had those, and then there was just a few crumbs of bread left over for those who worked the whole day and couldn't get there until much later. It wasn't that everybody had the day off. Well, those are the kinds of things that give us a clue. They met in the evening uh, on that, uh, at that time. Scheduling of services, and I want to come back to it sometime. Well, maybe I'm, I'll just say a word here because I'm probably going to run out of time before I get back to it. Boy, am I ever. Um, <laughs> the early church was flexible in terms of the times in which it met. Uh, yesterday, a woman asked me uh, after, or this morning, I guess, uh, after the, uh, the chapel service, what can you do to, uh, to bring out more people on a Sunday night? And I said, what do you want? It's a lousy night. Fact is, in the last 30 years, it has become the dominant night for families. And guess who also puts on the biggest productions on Sunday night now? Television programs. Look at all of the things that you're competing with. And unlike 30 years ago, the vast majority of spouses work uh, along with uh, their spouses. They go off <coughs> together, husband and wife, on Monday morning. They get the kids off, and they're both going to work. They don't want to be out on Sunday night. You're far more likely to get them out on a Friday night or a Saturday night than a Sunday night. And boy, have I been through that trying to find 50 ways to get people out on a Sunday night. There are certain times, if you schedule a half a dozen services in the course of the year, big things where there are image builders in the community and cantatas and maybe a Billy Graham film or something of that nature, a special occasion, you can get a number of people out, and you can get them to come out for a few weeks, but they won't make a long-range commitment if they're under the age of 50 to a Sunday night service. So give up on it. It took me four years to get my deacons to do that, and what really happened was I said, I will continue to go if you do. And guess what? We were able to get rid of them. <laughs> but the, deacons, the deacons didn't want to go either. But they wanted me to go because we had to have a time for an alternate service for people who had to work on Sunday morning. That idea is okay, but Sunday night is a lousy time for the alternative service. It just is. Now, if you tell me you've got as many people coming out on a Sunday night as you do on a Sunday morning, uh, raise your hand. Let me see. That might be true, but that's, you do. Good for you. Notice out of how many people in here, there's one person raised their hand. That should say something along the way. The earliest example of Christian worship that we have comes out of the second century. It's roughly around 160 AD. Justin Martyr tells something of the contents of the earliest worship services. 
I'm going to jump into something really quick here in another direction. This is uh, his uh, apology, his first apology, it's chapter 67. And it's the earliest description of any worship service. We have numerous uh, accountings saying that there was a time of worship or they gathered together to do this and that and the other. But this is a full accounting. Justin says, on the day called Sunday, there is a meeting in one place and those who live in the cities or the country and the... Um, those who live in the, uh, one place or uh, those who live in the cities and countries, they come together and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets, which might be our Old Testament, are read as long as time permits. And when the reader has finished, the president, I like that term, that was the pastor. The president, in a discourse, urges and invites us to the imitation of these noble things. Then we stand up together and offer prayers. And as said before, when we have finished the prayer, bread is brought and wine and water, and the president similarly sends up prayers and thanksgivings, uh, thanksgivings to the best of his ability, and the congregation assents, saying the amen. The distribution and the reception of the sacred or the consecrated elements by each one takes place, and they are sent to the absent by the deacons. Those who prosper and those who wish contribute each one as much as he chooses to do. Which of what is collected is deposited with the president and he takes care of the orphans and the widows and those who are in want on account of sickness or any other cause and those who are in bonds and the strangers who are sojourners among us. And briefly, he is the protector of all those in need. We all hold this in common gathering on Sunday since it is the first day on which God transforming darkness and matter made the universe and Jesus Christ our Savior rose from the dead on the same day for they crucified him on the day before Saturday and on the day after Saturday he appeared to his apostles and disciples and taught them these things which I have passed on to you that is the earliest statement we have in reference to worship uh, a worship service uh, and it comes out of the second century the church was typically communal in uh, its orientation. It was body uh, formed, and that is that we, they cared for one another, and they had music, and there's a number of references to music um, in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 26 to 33, you'll remember Paul speaks about when the church gathers, the one person has a scripture, one has a, a, a testimony or a prophecy, one has a hymn. Uh, it's verse 26. Anyway, there were those who came and they shared. You will also see in uh, Ephesians 5, 19 and 20, that those uh, uh, people were not to be drunken with wine wherein is excess, but to be filled with the Spirit, and they are to be making melody in their hearts, singing psalms and hymns. Now, some of those psalms weren't much longer. We have a few. Some are in the New Testament. are not much longer, and some are a lot shorter than some of the choruses we sing today. There are some people who will stand before God someday, and God will ask them what good they have done when they are coming into the kingdom. And they will say, before God, I never sang a chorus. <laughs> Praise God. Can I come in? And there are some others on the other side. Praise the Lord, I never got around to one of those ungodly hymns. Both are wrong. That's just my prejudice, which doesn't show very much in all of this. I have a number of uh, references to some of the songs and psalms that are given in the New Testament. The use of the early uh, Christian creeds in uh, the New Testament, fairly common, and they were often read and cited in the church. There's a number of them. The oldest creed that's found in the New Testament is Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's another one that's very uh, typical. It's some think it might also not only have been a creed, it was also a hymn. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5, where Paul speaks about the gospel that he received, that he passed on. That, and that's a key word, these hymns or creeds were often initiated with the word that. That, he died um, uh, for our sins uh, according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he was seen 
Uh, he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen. Um, first of all, by Cephas, then the twelve, and then by um, above 500 brethren, then James and the rest of the apostles, and then last of all by Paul. Now, are you impressed on how I said that? <laughs> that takes you up to verse 9, or verse 8 of 15. But if you knew the balance of it, it was put in a form that could have been easily sung as well as taught as a creed. It's evenly balanced. Each of the lines starts off with a hati, that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day um, uh, and was seen. Uh, then it starts with the word then. Then he was seen, first of all, by Cephas, then the twelve, then he was seen by uh, the 500 brethren, then he was seen by James. The word then, there's two Greek words for then, and it's eta and apeta, and it's in a rhythmic balance. Eta, apeta, eta, apeta, throughout this whole thing. And finally, he was seen by me. These are the kinds of things that the early Christians added in their teaching. They were easily remembered. And if somebody came along and, and missed out one of the lines, they'd say, oops, you got two agents in a row there, Pastor. There must be an apeta after that. It can't be exactly what you got. You missed something along the way. Everybody could pick it up. Jewish ways of teaching were remarkable in the ancient world. Well, worship today. You know, I wanted to say just a little bit, uh, and I've messed up along the way uh, in terms of what I wanted to share. I'm out of time. It's 8.30, but since Bob took a couple minutes longer than what I wanted to do, <laughs> and Malcolm had a very wonderful explanation of who George Bullard is, I'll just say that worship, of course, must have meaning uh, and integrity and a sense of change and sensitivity to those who are around us. Uh, if it doesn't have those things, and to me those are four characteristics, if people come in and they don't understand what's going on, it doesn't have meaning. And you can have a church service that has things that are rather unique and different, but you must explain them to the people if you expect the people to get anything out of them. Uh, I ask who the worship services are for. Are they for Christians or non-Christians? That's one of the big issues that uh, comes into place again and again. And some people say we're wanting to be super sensitive. We want people who are not Christians to come into the church. That has biblical precedence, by the way. Paul speaks of it, of the unbelievers coming in when the people were speaking tongues in the service and they would think that they were mad. He makes it axiomatic. It was understood that unbelievers were welcome in the Christian worship experiences. And the churches that were doing their best to invite people to come into the kingdom of God had to make sure that what was going on was understandable to those who were coming in. So being clear in that, I think it's important. Can the worship service ever be used as an avenue of evangelism? Of course it can. Should the gospel be preached every Sunday and only evangelism? Of course not. But should the gospel ever be presented in worship? Absolutely. I think that with all my heart. And the reason I can say that is you can see that in early worship. The purpose of the worship services today is just the same as it was in the first century. It is to get people into the presence of God and to have a life-changing, transforming experience with Almighty God. If they have an evangelistic purpose, wonderful. I think whether you are the seeker-sensitive types or not, is irrelevant as long as you try to make clear what is taking place to all who come into the church. And that takes me into the B section, the language, the stories, and the actions of worship. It can all be wonderful. I remember reading a book on worship, and then I went to a, a, an Anglican church in Britain, and I was greatly blessed in uh, reading the Book of Common Prayer. I kept saying, there's not much in there that I disagree with. That's pretty good. That's not bad. And some of the prayers were majestic, and I, I, I relished in it. It doesn't do something for everybody else, but it did for me. But there are certain things, barriers in worship, we need to be mindful of. A lot of people who are coming into our churches don't know the language of church. And that's one of the difficulties, as we mentioned last night, that younger people have in going to church. We had a bulletin that had an introit. What in the world is an introit, they would say. 
what is a benediction? I have a pastor friend who was asked at his ordination to pronounce the benediction. He was ordained before he went to seminary, and he didn't know what he was supposed to do. Now, he was being ordained in the ministry and didn't know what a benediction was. What is the glory of Patri? And it's a wonderful song, and I love to sing it in church. But please clarify what it is. Uh, we decided to take all of the language that was in the bulletin, like uh, choral introit and invocation and all of this God talk language that didn't mean a lot to the unbeliever and simply put uh, uh, opening prayer and closing prayer and things like that. It just made it much more simple uh, so people could at least follow along and they at least knew where you were going. Think of all of the terms that people have to remember when they come to your church. Vestibule, where is it? Is that a bathroom? <laughs> uh, what is it? Narthex, where else do you hear the word narthex? We decided to change the word narthex to lobby, and everybody knew what a lobby was. <laughs> they talk about the lobby at a movie theater, and it's about the same size, or normally they have a little bit bigger ones than those at the church. Trying to find a way to translate the language we use. We use a lot of God talk. A number of years ago in Oxford, uh, Don John Macquarie wrote a book called God Talk, and he encouraged the Christian community to get rid of the God Talk, or at least explain it. What do you mean when you say saved, soul, and even justified and sanctified? How often do Christians use those terms? I don't think we should necessarily get rid of them, but every time we use them in worship, we should explain them. There's an awful lot of people that have confusion about what those special words in the Christian vocabulary mean even born again. What does that really mean? And people come in, and, and we will get involved in saying those things, and people don't know what they mean, and they can't buy into what we're trying to say. The translating of the stories also. I can remember a time when we could say, you all remember the story of Jonah, or Daniel in the lion's den. Well, now they don't remember. They're biblically illiterate. And if you want to help them in their worship experience summarize, that story. Give a one-minute summary of that and then make your point. But don't expect them to know all about Samson and Delilah. There's a few stories, David and Bathsheba, that might transcend the barriers. But most of them haven't got a clue on what some of those key stories in the Bible are that are a part of our spiritual journey. So the other area is the familiarity that some people have with what they're supposed to do in a worship service. I talked to a few people who I asked, why you don't go to a church service? Well, I don't want to be embarrassed. Well, how would you be embarrassed? Well, I don't know when to sit or to stand or what I'm supposed to do when that cup comes by me. I don't know any of those kinds of things. We have a culture in the church, and if we want people to come in, we have to clarify what that culture is. Every baptismal service I had, I always put a bulletin insert in to say what baptism is and who qualifies for it, what its significance is, and so on. Every communion service, we did the same. And I might note that I shared in one of the meetings that we dismissed people ahead of time. Uh, we concluded our service and had a two-minute interlude. The organist played and so on. And then we set up, because that service is really not for non-Christians. They were welcome, but we put in a bulletin insert that said what communion was all about. It's amazing how many people don't know what it is. We had people that they took this bulletin insert on baptism home and said, you know, I think I'd like to do that. It just clarified everything for them. For them, it was just somebody who thought it was getting wet. And then the bulletin insert said, oh no, there's something wonderful along the way. The word relevance is sometimes a swear word, and I think that there's nothing wrong with being relevant to the people of God. Uh, the people that have come to worship together or God has called us to speak to or to minister to, he wants us to have a relevant word. One of the most uh, heinous things that I think happens to the prophets is when we make them all relevant to our day and forget their original context. There was a message of the prophets for the people in the prophets' day. The primary function of a prophet was to speak the word and the will of God to the people that God had told the prophet to speak to. And that message had a relevance to the people in that day. I think prophecy, preaching, communicating the word of God today needs to do exactly 
the same thing. It must be relevant. Most of the emphases in worship today have recognition, adoration, celebration, forgiveness, obedience, seeking God's will. Some add beyond that also an absolution of sin. Now that's a tradition in a number of churches. Somewhere in the worship service and often before you get to the sermon, and certainly before you get to the Lord's table, you must be absolved of your sin. And of course, Jesus did say, whoever remits the sin, they will be remitted. He said to his disciples, the John chapter 20 passage. That's not a typical thing in the ancient history of the church. It is not a uniform characteristic. It is simply one of the pluralities of experiences that some churches have. It is not wrong, and it is not the only way to do it. Some churches ask for people to make confessions of sin at the end of the service, but it varies in the ancient history, the historical tradition. Open services to the public, the atmosphere, the, the music. Let me just say a word about the, the music, because that's where the, the real stuff is, isn't it? Oh, man. Yeah, the, uh, okay, well, feel free to go at any time. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up here pretty quick. The, the music that uh, was used in the ancient times was a music that communicated with the people. And for the most part, uh, what you see in the characteristic uh, of early Christian worship was that it was charismatic and it was Eucharistic, charismatic in the sense that it sought the presence of God and depended upon the Spirit of God. It was Eucharistic, it was thankful, it was also celebrating. There is absolutely very little that is Christian about a worship service that uh, is not celebrating. We have something to celebrate. There's good news to be found in Jesus Christ. And of all people, we need to celebrate. And I love the psalms that celebrate. You can't have a celebration all of the time, but oh, I think in most worship services, it's good to have people coming into the sanctuary or the worship center, and they walk in and they hear some celebrative music. And you know, I've heard organists do preludes, and it sounded like we were at a funeral service as the worship service was about to start. And folks, honestly, Bach had some celebrating music. If you're stuck with Bar Bach, that's okay. He had some good stuff. Use it. I remember uh, teaching, uh, preaching, with, uh, team teaching, biblical preaching. I did the biblical side with our homiletics professor. And after hearing the students give some sermons in their senior sermons, I commented to them that I felt that I had been to three funeral services in the course of that day. Funerals don't belong on Sunday morning. They belong every other day of the week. There are some who believe that the water that they were baptized in was converted through a miracle of Jesus into pickle juice, and they act that way. It's a terrible thing. The pulpit itself is also something that is have we come to the time, and we don't know this, I don't know this, have we come to the time when we need to think of another way of communicating? Now, as you know, when Jesus traveled from place to place, he did carry a pulpit with him and set it up. And he stood behind it, he had his notes out there. It's in the Bible, I know it's somewhere. They're there. When you look at your television set and you watch the news, I know behind them they're looking at a screen that has all kinds of words up there, but you don't see them, do you? And there's barriers between you and the preacher when the preacher stands behind the pulpit. The scariest thing in the world for me ever to do was to walk out from behind the pulpit because I was able to hide back here and hopefully you wouldn't see all of my deficiencies and my sin. And I was challenged by two people, George Buttrick and Haddon Robinson. Look at the way that people communicate today. And that's the way you need to communicate the gospel. When I come up to a student, I don't say, would you stand on the other side of the lectern so I can talk to you about your term paper? That's absurd. Or can you imagine a parent saying, would you sit down there, son? I want to talk to you about making your bed. 
There is, a something, there is something about a sacred desk. Originally, and in the ancient world when churches first started to be developed, namely at the end of the earliest ones are at the end of the second century AD. Up until that time, the vast majority were in homes. And by the end of the third century AD, you begin to see some much larger structures begin to emerge, and then they were confiscated by the state and destroyed and then given back to them and rebuilt uh, by Constantine later on. But they, at that time, had a table on which the scriptures would be placed. But we don't have pulpits much before that time. Um, what is the requirement of our day and age? Um, Haddon Robinson said, lately you've got to change. Well, I was comfortable with the way I was doing it for years and years and years. And seven years ago, I made the change. It scared me absolutely to death. I work much harder on sermons now than I ever did before. There's nothing wrong with sermon notes or preparing a sermon and knowing what you're going to say. But if you want to communicate with the people, take away the barriers that hide you from uh, those people. Uh, a number of years ago at Northern Baptist Seminary, I'm trying to remember the, the man's name wrote a book, uh, Preaching Without Notes. Goodness, it's 40 years old uh, already. Old book, old book. And he had saw the differences and the responses that the people had when the person just came out there and talked versus standing behind and reading a manuscript. You've got to do something with that if you want to communicate with this generation. I encourage people never to end sermons on bad notes. It's not the point to have a bully pulpit up there. Let it be prophetic preaching. Um, in terms of worship style, which one is right, I don't think anyone is necessarily wrong unless you don't commune with God. Unless you don't experience the presence of God. That one's inappropriate. And there are all kinds of ways in which the Christian community experience God. I just <clears throat> must admit I get very impatient when people just say it's always this way and it's never that way. I have experienced, I've, said, I've had a wonderful, meaningful experience of worship when I was meeting with some troops under a tree on the side of a mountain at, uh, uh, at a military camp. And there's tanks around us and that kind of a thing, and we're singing hymns and praise to God, and all of a sudden, we sensed God's presence in a wonderful way, and there were some folks that came to faith in Christ almost regularly, sitting out in ways where we just didn't have all of the physical things to have a worship service in a formal sanctuary. Are you saying that that experience was inappropriate because they didn't have a formal sanctuary? We couldn't take one out to the field, but we experienced God. Uh, if we are open to what God is doing when we come into worship, we can experience God in a variety of forms. But if we don't seek for that, I think everything else that we do is largely a waste of time if we don't experience that kind of a thing. Characteristics of Christian worship, certainly love and joy and praise to God and obedience to God. The worship must be relevant for those people for whom it is intended. Don't give something that's 30 years old to the congregation. Make it relevant to their own generation. Uh, I need to stop at this point. Let me just take a few moments for some some uh, interaction if you want. Uh, you can turn that. Yeah. Um, essentially, every church that I know of that is doing well has a worship experience that people can understand and experience and encounter God in that moment. There are all kinds of studies about worship experience. That changes from year to year, from generation to generation. There are some traditional worship services that I personally like, but I know that the vast majority of them do not draw people in. They have well-intentioned people, and the congregations are continuing to go down. Uh, a church that I really have admired for many, many years, and Lloyd Ogilvy was a pastor of it, at the Hollywood Presbyterian Church in Southern California, it has had a 20-year decline in its attendance. They have a wonderful, majestic, worship experience, and they have people who are classical in their orientation, and when they do it, the traditional service, they do it well. But the congregation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're in the midst of a thriving community that's being rejuvenated in Hollywood. 
what is their witness in the community? Now, they're a small, much smaller church now. They run about 1,500, but they were at about 6,000. Uh, so it's been a continual decline. Most of the churches that haven't changed their style of worship to reach out to the next generation are not growing and they're not even holding on. That's the majority of them. I know that there are some exceptions here and there. Should we make changes in worship? Um, if you do, there's a price to be paid. You know that. But if you don't, there's another price to be paid. You know that. What form of worship that has integrity and meaning can reach out into our community and draw our youth, our younger people, our future back into our churches? Some churches have made those transitions. Those are tough decisions. Those are not easy decisions. There's a lot of pain in that. I've seen emotion and tears when churches tried to change in that area. So I don't have a, an easy answer for it. Any comment? Yes, sir. All the way in the back. Kevin? special time in which Christians have to meet. Uh, I think Christians have a fair amount of flexibility. You find that in the early church. Early on, they met almost daily. That's the point in the book of Acts, in chapters 2 through 5. And then it seems to be the first day of the week uh, that they begin to meet uh, uh, as Christians. Now, the holy kiss was a cultural thing. You still find that in the Middle East today. Most of the time, it is men with men and women with women, and not the other way around. I've seen people try to use that as a means to justify sloppy agape. And I think we need to be very careful with it. Uh, I've seen far too many people get carried away with, oh, I just want to show that I love you in Jesus. You know, all that other stuff. Uh, be careful that your motives are the right motives. Uh, I don't do that. And let me just say why. Some people do it with, uh, you know, they can do it and get by with it. Uh, or get away with it. <laughs> get, get by with it, yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> we had a, a fellow, Dale Saxton, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I think uh, maybe the Ashleys remember him from there. He was the associate pastor at uh, the church where Roger Fredrickson was pastor and Sioux Falls for a number of years. Every time a person came forward in the church to make a commitment to Christ, he wrapped his arms around them and wanted them to know how wonderful they were and how much God loves them. But there was a time we noticed a woman started coming forward regularly every Sunday. For her <laughs> <laughs> and it became obvious that she wanted a full body hug. And he would try to stick out his hand like this to stop it. There might be something you think you can handle, but not everybody else can. And uh, I've shared with folks and students at the seminary, I did it earlier this year, I have seen a number of pastors who were asked to leave because they got too close to the line and they couldn't demonstrate that, that they hadn't gone over it. I have never once in my 40 years of being a Christian seen a pastor fired for being square. And I'll just be square. Uh, that's an area where the church is not forgiving. Uh, the, if you really feel that you've got to do the, the holy kiss, which was a cultural thing in the Middle East uh, and some other parts of the world, uh, do it with somebody of the same gender. It's not as much fun, but... I probably saw somebody else... Uh, I'm doing that.
Well, for me, integrity means that it is not contrary to the scriptures, but it advances what the scriptures are calling us to do when we come in to worship, that we worship an awesome God. For me, integrity uh, will not allow me personally to put Coke and cake on the communion table and do the Watusi in the aisle and miss the point of what it is. Though there's some churches that have done that. I cannot do that with any sense of integrity. That's gone further. Uh, when we're having a communion service, I've had one experience where I terminated a communion service early. Uh, we had just gotten the bread served. And what happened was that there were some younger people, uh, the high school group, were not only passing notes, but laughing and joking. And, and you could hear it all over the sanctuary. And nobody did a thing. And I looked in their direction, and, you know, that didn't work. And I finally said, young people, could you, could you hold it? And that didn't work. And nobody, no usher, no parent, did anything. To me, that was the wrong context for experiencing <coughs> communion with God and what that whole service was about. So the ushers came forward with the trays, and I stood out in front and asked the people to forgive me because the context was not appropriate for continuing that service. And I asked them to stand. I gave the closing prayer, and we all went home. And we never had a problem like that again in that church, and there are a lot of kids gave apologies during the week. That might have been too severe. But for me, I couldn't continue something that was a very special time in the life of the church that was meant to commemorate the story of Jesus and what he did on the cross for you and me. How can I do that when there's frivolity that's going on in that context? For me, that's a part of integrity as well. But integrity is important. I don't, as I get into your... <coughs> In the changes, if the changes are in the area of either the kind of music that's played, some of the choruses have no integrity. Personally, I believe that with all my passion. I would be written by scripture. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that one, but they simply don't have anything that's worthwhile saying. There's also some hymns in the hymn book that are the same. I can mention to you that I might step on some toes. Some are fairly popular. One of the things that I do like about the more recent focus of worship that uh, they have taught, the church has taught, uh, some of the charismatic communities have taught us to do, and that is to worship God. In the gospel tradition out of which I be became a Christian, and that was my spiritual journey, we gave testimonial songs. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart, rather than you, Lord. I thank you for what you have done. The, the more recent worship, I, I love it because it, it sings praise to God. And uh, not all of the hymns in the hymn book ignore that. Of course not. And many of them are sing, sung directly to the Lord. And there's a sense of worship. And when we're singing to God, wow, that's something else. But when I'm singing to you about what God has done in my life, that's a testimonial song. There may be room for that in a testimonial service. But uh, not everything that is published in a hymn book is worthwhile singing, and not everything in a chorus book is worthwhile singing. So do it, go through it, and be careful with what you do. But it's just because it's a chorus doesn't mean it's bad. There's some choruses that have a lot more theological integrity than some of the hymns that we have in our hymn book. Uh, David? change that you have to make, the people must be comfortable in knowing that you love them and care for them, and you've established a record with them uh, where they feel comfortable. And uh, they say, you know, this person has our best interest in mind. This is our pastor, and our pastor loves us. And she or he really will go the whole nine yards for me. And if they don't think that you're going to do that and be there with them, is you're wanting to make change. Uh, the people generally start by believing in a person before they believe in a cause and the person that sells that. And if you don't have uh, established the integrity with the people, there are certain things you can do almost immediately when you come as the new kid on the block. They expect you to make changes. But the bigger the change, you need to wait until you've established uh, credibility with the congregation.
that they know that you love them and care for them and you've demonstrated that they're far more likely to follow your lead. Is that, is that okay? And I, so Dr. I think I'll stop with this last question right up here. I, I, I read recently that last Thursday, this is about you. I don't know if that's scriptural or not, but how do you feel about the services where we use a lot of laughter and hard to work with this? <coughs> well, you're talking to the uh, Toronto experience. Yeah. 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 Um, that's received a lot of, um, I've never been to one of their services. I saw uh, one that a news media had uh, um, put across on a TV program on one occasion. What I saw didn't do much for me. Uh, if the goal is laughter, um, to me the goal is ultimately to be in touch with God. I've had some moments when I was so filled with joy for what God has done and I, I started to laugh. That was, it was me. Uh, I, I remember having that when a child was born in our home. I was filled with joy. And I had tears while I was laughing. I said, this is fantastic. I'm a dad. This is incredible. Uh, I felt that way when I became a Christian. But I, I think the focus, and as you know, the vineyards pulled away from that. Uh, they withdrew support. John Wimble withdrew support because they thought it had gone a little too far where all of a sudden the experience uh, takes the place of the reality of the experience with God. Um, there are some that feel that this is what they can do, and I want to be careful about not judging them too harshly. I, I can't do all of that. Uh, I've seen people who did the same thing with tongues. It is a legitimate expression of the presence and activity of God in a person's life, but not every person speaks with tongues. But there are some people who so maximize the it that they forget the source and what it's there to do, to build the body of Christ as a gift of the Spirit, and the ultimate goal of worship just to glorify God, and not this it. And everything we have, and I've seen Christians, well, you know, I, I got Jesus. You know, I, he's my Savior. He's my Lord. Now I just need this extra over here. That's an unbiblical statement. Everything that you have as a child of God comes through Jesus Christ. The only gift God gave to you is Jesus Christ, and everything else comes through Christ. And we need to be careful that we don't substitute it for Christ. And I've seen places, I've been in places, where they did. And they were working on trying to get an experience going quite apart from what God has done for us in Christ. That, to me, doesn't have as much integrity as what it, what it needs to have. And I'm so glad that all of you have been more than gracious.